mentioned you only had those six FM uh, synth voices. Um, was that ever a challenge for you, or was that just part of the creative process? Oh, it was a huge, huge challenge, and and one that you know a lot of folks back then. Um, you know, found extremely difficult. Um, I, mm-hmm. I thought it was a challenge, but a fun challenge. You know, I, I, it was, it was challenging in a fun way to me. You know, when I worked on Disney's right. Aladdin, for example, you know, I would get the scores to the Alan Menken, uh, Tim Rice thing, which, which was, uh, you know, for the movie, which, you know, was like a hundred players, you know, and it's like, okay, <laughs> right. how do you get a hundred players, uh, down to six monophonic voices, right? So, right. you know, if you play a piano and a piano hits a hits a triad with a bass in the thing, that's five or six voices right there, just for one instrument, yeah. right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, the challenge became focusing on the melodies and the counter melodies and the percussion and which was the most important thing. So for me, I loved it. I, I always thought it was, you know, fun uh, to do that kind of stuff and uh, you know really make it as big as possible yeah just another question that we had when you were composing back then did you write the music like away from the technology on a piano guitar or no. something well sometimes sometimes if I was messing around I'd, I'd start on a piano maybe sometimes yeah uh, just to kind of get up that motif or that riff but once I had that initial thing I went straight to the Genesis mm. creating it in inside the Genesis there was an amazing uh, uh, real-time audio sound tool uh, called gems oh. uh, and gems stood for like the genesis emulator music system uh, okay. uh and in fact you guys know who mark miller was yeah i think some he did some work on the original earthworm right he he, he converted the super nintendo version of earthworm jim for me on that first one yeah uh oh. but he also he's a, he's a he was a great composer he he did the music for toe jam and earl and oh, uh, yeah. a bunch of really great games um his brother was actually the one who who created this gems tool and uh and okay. what it allowed me to do is basically play the genesis just like i would a synthesizer so i could hook up my midi keyboard and and it was a special cartridge and it literally had a midi cable jacked out of the actual circuit board and oh my and, gosh and so i could like plug right into the board and a- actually play that fm chip right on the genesis so i could play it in real time and then record that onto a sequencer and and you know, sequences were just coming out at the time. I mean, I was on like, you know, Cakewalk 1.0 for DOS. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, kind of a, a way you record, you could record MIDI files. So, um, yeah, I mean, that that was a huge... W- without that, I uh, the stuff wouldn't have sound half as good. Uh, and you can thank uh, John Miller for that, Mark's brother. That's so interesting. Well, one thing kind of related to that is when you go... I know it's a long time ago. When you go back to some of your early work, whether it's for something something like Earthworm Jim or Cool Spot, do you still enjoy it today? Or is it sometimes difficult to go back, as I imagine it might be for artists who have such lengthy careers? You know, it, it's funny. I actually enjoy it. Um, I, I, you know, and I'll find people will like, you know, on YouTube will post levels and post music. And uh, and sometimes they'll post like I, just recently. In fact, I downloaded the entire Genesis version of Cool Spot that somebody had, had, had posted online. <laughs> I was like, man, I haven't uh-huh. heard this stuff in like 20 years. And then yeah. I, I listened to it. And it, to me, it's fun and it brings back memories. You know, I mean, I wouldn't listen to it in my car stereo or anything. But <laughs> but to, to go back to it, uh, you know, it, it brings back fond memories. And uh, and no, I listen to it and go, wow, that, that actually sounds pretty good still. Like, like I, yeah. I was... Um, I was watching some YouTube videos. Somebody did a uh, a power run of Aladdin, and and you know, and, and I was and I was watching it. You know, they finished the whole game in like thirty minutes or something, mm-hmm. and uh, and I was watching, it, listening to the music and stuff, going, wow, you know, that's, that and and even watching the game. I'm watching this game, going, you know what? That game is still looks and plays awesome. Right. I mean, how right. many, you know, I mean, there's all the classic video games and stuff, and not too many of them can make that 20-year leap. You know, there's there's a Mario, you know, stuff like Mario and Sonic and stuff where you can still go back to the original, and it, and it still plays great and looks awesome and sounds good. So, um, 
yeah, you know, and, and that is the thing. I mean, I had such a great team around me, the programmers and the artists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when you have an amazing team like that of animators, like for Earthworm Jim and Aladdin and stuff, you know, it makes my job so much easier because, you know, it, it sounds better because it looks so good. <laughs> right. Well, we, we just have to ask. We're absolutely huge fans of the Genesis Aladdin and um, especially a lot of the original music for the game. Now, I'm aware that there is a man named Don. Donald Griffin, yeah. who composed a lot of the original music. What was he like, and how did that process? Did he work on the machine at all, or did you input his compositions, or how did that work? Correct. Yeah. No, he he never worked on the on the Sega uh, on the Genesis. Uh, so Don was an amazing uh, orchestrator, and so he and I don't read music. Mm -hmm. I don't read sheet music at all. And so I, when I got these uh, Aladdin scores in, I was able to, you know, send them over to Don, who actually knows what he's talking, you know, knows what he's doing when it comes to music uh, and <laughs> sheet music and stuff. And so he kind of took all those and did uh, orchestrations of those songs. I would then take his files and then kind of, uh, you know, pare them down even more and then mm -hmm. put those in uh in the sega genesis and he yeah he actually wrote a couple of original songs as well um as well as myself so yeah he he helped out a lot on that uh project he he was a great great resource because he he knew uh so much he knew his way around an orchestra and sheet music so well and i was able to kind of coach him into uh giving me files midi files that i could then use to uh to you know help put in the game yeah, right. we're always just so interested in those kind of obscure composers that, for whatever reason, um, you know, didn't really do a lot after that. So a lot of people, yeah. you know, probably aren't familiar with him. So it's always well, nice. Another question that I had, and I know it's a long time ago, but do you remember which track specifically you wrote and composed for the game? For Aladdin? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I, you know what? I have no flipping clue. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'd I'd have to go back and redo it. I, I gosh. Yeah, they have they definitely have some goofy titles like Camel Jazz, Turban Jazz, <laughs> Arab Rock. Yes, yeah, all all that stuff was stuff that David Perry uh, just named at the very end of the game. Oh. Like you know, he didn't even ask me. You know, and I didn't, <laughs> I, and I didn't even care. Don't get me wrong. You know? Right. Back then, you didn't you didn't care. It was just like you know, the day before they submitted, he went through and he said, "Shoot, I better name these." And, and so, yeah, I, I specifically remembered uh, Dave Perry. I'm like, "Who the hell named this?" And Dave's like, "Oh, no, I did that." So that's so funny. Uh, yeah, you know, actually, you know, funny t uh, talking about uh, you know back then. I myself and Dave Perry and and Doug Tenapel, you know, the the team that that worked on Genesis and all those great games, Aladdin, those things. Um, it was a group of like about twelve of us, and mm -hmm. uh, Mike Dietz, Ed Schofield. Um, we we were like brothers, you know. We, everyone hung out, and everyone, you know, uh, we had such a fun time. And for the most part, we never had a game design document. It huh. was always like we'd come to work and we'd like try to make each other laugh, uh, you know, and 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 that was kind of our game design. And um, but the interesting thing is the first game we all worked on together was Global Gladiators. Uh, and then after that, we worked on Cool Spot right away. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we did Aladdin. Um, well, we were all working at Virgin at at the end of Aladdin. And then by the end of Aladdin, that's when Dave left and took all the guys with him and he formed Shiny Entertainment. I left at the oh. same uh, I left about three or four months after that and to form my own studio. But what a lot of people uh, don't realize is in the very first Earthworm Jim game uh, I'm, not, I'm not even down as the music composer. So huh. I'm not in the credits to the first Earthworm Jim game. We put Mark Miller's name in there. Uh, even though I had done, uh, you know, all of the, the music and implementation. The reason for that is I was still working at Virgin uh, right oh. before the game came out, and I was kind of moonlighting. Uh, <laughs> doing all the, oh. the I was wondering about that. Yeah, so I would do all the Earthworm Jim music when I was, uh, you know, at night when I would get home and 
uh, you know, I just I, I didn't want to get anyone in trouble, including myself. Uh, and, and, you know, they probably would have been fine with it anyway, you know, as long right. as I wasn't doing it on company time and, and this and that. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I, I just, you know, lay, let's put Mark's name down there just in case. Uh, but what, what Mark actually did do on Earthworm Jim is for the Super Nintendo version, he took all my Genesis music and then converted it over oh. uh, to, uh, to the Super Nintendo. Well, yeah, there's such a consistency between Earthworm 1 and 2 musically that that makes so much more sense now that it was all you because it sounds like all one composer. Both of those games are just... And I, and I actually had a couple of uh, composers uh, working with me as well on Earthworm Jim. See, I, I, I love collaborations. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love it. I'm not one of these guys who just wants to, uh, you know, sit in the studio and, and just work by myself and take credit for everything. That's, that's never how I was musically. I love working with other people because I find that when you work with other people, your work never gets boring. It never gets old, mm -hmm. you know, and it always sounds new and fresh and different right you know um because uh you know so for for like for some of the wacky type tunes you know for earthworm jim i'd actually work with a banjo player you know really and, and things like this and say okay look you know teach me how to play banjo on on a midi keyboard or or here write some music and then I'll translate it in MIDI and then we'll put it in the game. And so just different parts like that, you know, uh, and, and even some of the, uh, you know, some of the like the Dixieland tunes and things mm -hmm. like that. Like I didn't know much about Dixieland at all. So I, I brought in a guy who, you know, who loved Dixieland music and I would, you know, sit with him and, and have him do stuff. And we'd, you know, trade files back and forth until it, you know, got the right flavor. And uh, so, yeah. I, I always love uh, love working with people, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's I think that's when real you know cool magic happens. That's absolutely fantastic. Now, since a large part of your career has to do with orchestral video game music and orchestral arrangements of like classic video game tunes, as of now, what do you think the difference is between that type of uh, symphonic video game music versus like symphonic film or TV music? And um, how have you seen that change as games have become more cinematic themselves? Well, the uh, the the reality is is that the the big difference between film music and and video game music it's when you watch a film it's a story right and right. somebody's telling you a story through dialogue so 80% of a film mostly is people talking therefore the music is considered background music or incidental music and what we do in video games is foreground music is what i like to call it because it's <laughs> it's interactivity and gameplay that drive our medium and and so, you know, we're able to have music in front of your face, out front, all the time. It's like we get the action scene to a movie every single time, you know? And right. so so that's one huge difference. Of course, there's the interactive elements as well to what we do. So we're able to, uh, you know, branch off into different areas depending on what the story is doing or what the player is doing, which is much different from linear film. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, that enables us to be able to be more creative. For example, even the great John Williams had to sit down with George Lucas and, and they had to go, okay, uh, George said, hey, hey, John, uh, okay, here's the scenario at four 46 seconds, the music has to do this because Darth Vader just walked through the door. Right, and then right. at two minutes and 30 seconds, it must do this because the Death Star just blew up. You know, so John Williams has to sit there and write music to exactly the timing and to exactly what's on film. Whereas with video games, a, d a designer will come to me and say, OK, here's the scenario. We got 100 guys on horseback with swords all coming to kick your ass. <laughs> write me write me a three minute piece of music. I can then, you know, go into my own little world and imagine what that would be like. I don't have any barriers. I don't have yeah. any, you know, restrictions or fences around. Me, right. And there's know? no like time structure to it because video games exactly. are so interactive, you know, where film, it's such a static medium, you know, exactly at this time, something's going to happen. Exactly. And, 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 and even talking another instance about time is that, you know, a film is called it's post-production. Music is done after the film is done. So any film composer, they have about six weeks to eight weeks to write an hour and a half 
worth of music. Now, you go and ask any film composer, and I'm friends with every one of them, uh, <laughs> and they'll all tell you, yeah, they never listen to their music after the film's done because they, it all felt rushed. It felt like a, they wish they had mm. more time and this and that. Whereas with video games, we have two years. <laughs> you know, we got... You know, it takes a game two years, so we can go back, we can change music if we don't like it, we're relaxed, we can go back and do things. So these are all the differences. Now, I'll tell you, though, why video game, why I think, in my opinion, video game music is so revered by so many and why people have such an emotional attachment to video game music. Aside from the fact that it's getting blasted in your face a thousand times, mm -hmm. uh, Whereas with film, you know, you hear the music one time maybe, and then maybe if you get the Blu-ray six months later, you hear it again. You know, a perfect example of this is, you know, hum me the music to Avatar. Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm, scratch right? my head. So, <laughs> and it's a great film, and it's a great score, and it's great characters, but mm -hmm. you just, you know, don't remember. It gets lost in everything else. Right. Um, but, but I think the main reason why so many people are emotionally attached to video game music is that when you play a video game, you become that character, right? As you're going through this world. Right. Therefore, the music, in essence, becomes the soundtrack of your life. That's brilliant. As you're this character. And you become attached to that music. Yeah, it's your theme. You know? it's, it's your music. It's your theme. It's your, you know. That's so, so great. I, I think... I think that's why, uh, and that's much different from just sitting in a theater and watching somebody else's story, you know? Yeah, well, <laughs> this is just kind of for us. Back in the day, um, at least here in the U.S., we, we used to be really big fans of Judgment Day on G4. I believe it was a different title in Canada. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, kind of your time on G4, your experiences, and would you ever consider doing another show like that on TV? Yeah, well, you know, uh, we were doing the show way before G4 existed. And so, hmm. in fact, we were, the, yeah, we started the show back in 1995. Oh, wow. And, and so we were, in fact, the only company, uh, that's Greedy Productions, myself, Victor Lucas, uh, producing the show. But it was really Vic's, you know, whole concept mm -hmm. and, and, and production company that did a Greedy. He owned Greedy Productions. And Greedy was the only company when G4 started. They were the only outside company that was doing content for G4. Wow. Everything else was done in-house. In and the reality was we had already been doing successful TV shows in Canada uh, for over five, six years before G4 uh, even started. So, really? um, oh yeah. And, and so we were kind of the only ones who knew what we were doing as well. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind going on record as saying that because we had done it so many times. It's not right. to, it's, it's not to disparage, uh, mm -hmm. you know, anyone else, but I'm saying we had done it for so long. Yeah. Same thing. Actually, same thing with X Play as well. X Play came a few years uh, after Electric Playground had started, but they they ended up, uh, and this is like I think a year or two years into G Four is when they kind of bought Tech TV and those those right. programs move over. So when when Tech TV moved over to G Four, they they brought with them you know things like Attack of the Show and X Play that that mm. also had uh, you know also had experience in you know knowing what gamers. Uh, you know, are into and they were being made by gamers. Whereas most of the G4 stuff initially in the beginning, uh, you know, people were shooting in the dark. Right. Um, and, and so, uh, except for us, and we had an audience already and we had a formula that we knew worked. I guess that's what I'm really trying to right. say is that we had a formula that worked. And when G4 first started, they were trying to figure out the formula, and I don't think they ever did, ever. Yeah, I mean, uh, Judgment Day was fantastic. You and Victor were sort of like the Siskel and Ebert of, like, yes. video games. <laughs> <laughs> With such different personalities. Except this Ebert thinks that uh, video games are an art form. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, the thing is, we never had a script for the show. We would never even talk to each other before we filmed. It was just like we'd go play the game because we wanted to all be natural. Yeah. And you want it to be, you know, not scripted. And that was the one thing. I mean, you can always tell when stuff's oh, scripted. Yeah. And, and that's where G4 fell flat on its face, is that everything seems so scripted and so, you know, oh, this is what we think gamers will like. And, uh, and me and Vic were just two buddies. Yeah. Just like you two guys 
just talking about games. The only difference was there was a camera in front of us and it was on national television. I mean, you could you tell know? with Victor's reactions, like so many times you guys would disagree, like he would love a game and you just would hate it. And you could just <laughs> tell on his reaction. He's like, what are you talking about, Tommy? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, and the other way around too as well. But, right. uh, you know, there was a lot of times where I would purposely kind of play bad cop, uh, <laughs> you know, to his good cop because he was so overly kind. Oh, yeah, he yes. was so friendly I'd about it. Everything gave out a nine or a ten, and I'm like, come on. So sometimes I'd, 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 you know, I'd go a little overboard in uh, on purpose just to get a reaction out of him. Yeah, I mean, that's so, what yeah. made it fun for yeah. everybody. <laughs> well, there's a <laughs> that's so great. Well, there's um there's a pretty popular and we think quite magical YouTube video of Koji Kondo playing the Mario Brothers theme on piano, and there you are standing right next to him. What yeah. was what was that moment like? And are there any other moments like that throughout your career that have stuck with you? Yeah, so you know, there's I mean there's a ton, but but that particular moment, um, Koji Kondo, I, I started a nonprofit organization uh over eleven years ago called the Game Audio Network Guild. It was actually right around the same time I was uh starting video games live. And it's a nonprofit organization. We have over twenty five hundred uh, professional and non-professional game audio people uh, all over the world uh, who are a part of Gang. Uh, that's the letter spelled Game, mm-hmm. Gang, Gang Audio Network Guild. And uh, we have an awards ceremony every year at uh, the Game Developers Conference. And I was, uh, I'm an advisory board member for the Game Developers Conference, uh, had been for like probably 12 or 13 years. And so one of the things is I had asked Nintendo if we could get Koji Kondo to come to the Game Developers Conference uh, to give a speech. Because uh, I, I ran the whole audio portion of the Game Developers Conference. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with that, I said, and I would also like to give him a Lifetime Achievement Award in a separate ceremony to, uh, you know, kind of commemorate his amazing career. Uh, and we're happy to have a video games live concert that weekend <laughs> in San Francisco. And I'd love for him to, you know, so I had to pitch oh. this whole thing to Nintendo and, uh, and they, they love the idea. Uh, they got him over here and, and I told, uh, Kondo san, uh, who doesn't speak a lot of, uh, English. He understands some, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, I was telling him how I, I, you know, I really wanted to do a version of, I, I asked if he, if he had a version that he did and he says, yeah, well, I kind of have this jazz blues version that he does. It's kind of just like a personal thing that, that he created on his own that no one's really ever heard before. Mm. And I said, perfect. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, just you sitting at a piano doing what you do best, uh, from, from Mario and the amazing thing. Uh, and so that was me actually hearing it for the very first time oh, that wow. video that, yeah and, and everybody hearing it for the very first time uh and the great thing about that weekend as well is that miyamoto was also uh in town and me and uh me and shiggy uh go back about, i call him shiggy uh we go <laughs> we go back about 20 years uh of course i worked on the metroid prime uh games with them oh. but I, I knew him uh you know even before that um way before that in fact but so he was in town so i I asked Miyamoto-san to, you know, come to Video Games Live, which he did. But he also, he came to the uh, the Game Audio Network Guild Awards. He went he came, went to the Gang Awards to support his friend Koji. And, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, there's some great pictures uh, of myself, Koji, and Shigeru uh, on stage as I was giving him the, uh, the award, mm. giving Koji-san the award. We did a you know picture thing where I had uh, Miyamoto uh, come up after the show as well. So, uh, yeah, that was that was a pretty intense moment. Um, I can tell you one of the one of the craziest moments with video games live. Uh, oh, well, one other thing to add about Koji-san, when we played over in Japan in two thousand, uh, I think it was two thousand and nine. Mm-hmm. We played or eight or nine. We played the Tokyo Game Show. Uh-huh. Uh, video games live. We played we played two uh, two shows at the International Forum, which is the biggest indoor theater in all of Japan. Wow! And we did t- two big sold out shows, and I had everybody there: Akira and and you know uh, Koji San. They all performed in the show, and the amazing thing was, Koji San had never performed that song or never performed in front of a crowd in Japan. 
Oh my gosh. That was the very first time he had ever performed in his home country of Japan. That's Can you that's just that? tragic. Yeah, with all of the video game concerts that have been going on in Japan for 20 30 years, uh, you know, going back to the to the mid 80s with Dragon Quest, you know, um, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it when when they told me that. So so we kind of it was it was fun for me to help make history, for, you know, in that regards to, you know, to let the Japanese audience hear this this great product of their uh, country and their culture. You yeah. know, oh, yeah. so he's just an absolute legend and he's just fantastic. Absolutely. So great that you gave him that opportunity. Yeah, was, and there's a video of that as well. If you go on YouTube, there's a video of Koji playing with us in Japan as oh, well. Gosh. But I'd say the the biggest moment I think for us, uh, for me personally on stage, was a show we did in Taiwan, and it was the day after the Olympics in China. So I think that was 2008, I believe. Okay. And uh, for those who, who, who may not know, uh, Taiwan, the country, is owned by China. And Taiwan mm. has their own traditions, their own cultures. And, you know, they're not too you know, happy about the fact that, that China owns them. Because uh, they it kind of like reverted back to them. I don't know the exact details of it. But Taiwan was its own country. And then, you know, recently in history, uh, it reverted back to the Chinese. And they kind of like, you know, they own, they own Taiwan. They own Hong Kong, even mm -hmm. though they're their own countries and own cultures. So when Taiwan was in the Olympics, China didn't allow them to have their own flag. They oh, wow. had to wave the Chinese flag. And for the millions and millions of people of Taiwan, that was such a huge uh, hurt yeah. to them. You know, I mean, it was imagine that. Right. Right. You know, where, you know, they couldn't they couldn't fly their own flag. And so during the opening ceremony, uh, which was uh, that amazing, you know, amazing thing at the bird's nest that, that they pulled off, uh, they when they were walking in, they had the Chinese flag. The whole nation was mourning. Oh. Well, the next day, Video Games Live is in Taiwan. <laughs> and, and I said, you know what? Screw it. I don't care if they arrest me or not. Um, I'm going to bring a little bit of joy to, you know, the, the folks there. And uh, so I bought a huge Taiwan flag. Oh, my gosh. And wow. at the encore, when the encore was over, because I'm the American guy. Right, right. right. And, and and so at the end, when I came out for the encore, I had the Taiwan flag with me and I was carrying it across stage in honor of, you know, the country and what they were going through. And I can tell you, there were there were about, you know, 15, 16,000 people there. I have never heard a sound and, and the applause. And it was... I mean, people were crying in the oh aisles. It was so amazing. I couldn't believe it. I didn't think I would get that much of a response. And then, you know, I said something basically through the translator saying, you know, you know, well, this isn't the Olympics, uh, you know, and, and <laughs> the place just fell apart. I mean, it was unbelievable. That's, that's one moment that I'll, that I'll never forget for the rest of my life was hearing that audience. I mean, it was hurting my ears. It was so loud. And, and the meet and greet after the show was about six hours long. Oh I think God. every single person in that place came by to, you know, personally thank us. And again, people crying. Say, wow. You know, saying you don't know how much this means to us, that, that, that you recognize that and you're from the United States. That's so, so beautiful. It, it was pretty crazy. Wow. Well, uh, just to bring it back to the present, obviously, uh, you're so very involved and have such a knowledge of the industry. Um, are there any games recently that have come out where you've been particularly impressed by the score? Uh, I'll tell you. I mean, Skyrim, obviously, is a big one. Uh, Journey, you know, by Austin Wintry. Uh, mm -hmm. Shadow of the Colossus, of course. But I'll tell you the one, uh, oh, Uncharted. Uh, uh, but I'll tell you the one that blows my mind the most is uh, over the last couple of years, it also from an interactive standpoint. And mm -hmm. it's not, you're not going it, to, it's never on your top 10 best music lists but just the way they incorporated the music and how it draws you into the game the game red dead redemption absolutely 
so unbelievably phenomenal uh, the way they incorporated the music to that. Woody, uh, Bill and Woody did such an amazing job. Uh, and that was the very first game they ever worked on. Oh and gosh. the way the instruments and the interactivity and they just, wow, they just knocked it out of the park completely it was unbelievable so yeah uh, i feel like they totally influenced a lot of like more recent games like i don't know if you've played the last of us but oh yeah oh gosh yeah yeah, (laughs) like the way that music is implemented there um like that beautiful music but the way it's implemented was really reminiscent of red dead not only in the instrumentation but as far as like a lot of points where there's really no music and when the music happens how it's really sort of tugging at your heartstrings that's right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I we just are obsessed with The Last of Us. It's almost unhealthy how much we enjoy The Last of Us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, can we expect to see some more scores from you in the future? I know that you have so many different hats that you like to wear, whether it's with sound design. And obviously, I know Video Games Live keeps you very busy. But can we expect to, to hear some more composing from you uh, in the future? Uh, you know, I love... I. I, I composed music for video games for over 20 years. I worked on 300 video games. And when you compose for for anything, uh, you know, you're in your little dark studio at three in the morning all by yourself. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like... and when you finish a song, it's kind of like you put a little note in a bottle and send mm. it out in the ocean. You really don't know who's going to hear it and how it's going to be received and, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> or... Uh, I could be on stage performing in front of tens of thousands of people hmm. all over the world and getting instant feedback and that adrenaline and that, you know. So to me, if I had to choose one of them, I would choose video games live every time. Hmm, right. um, and the reality is, is that, you know, enable in order to do a, a game these days, you know, a, a big AAA game, you have to dedicate to at least two years of your life. You know, yeah. I mean, I worked on Metroid Prime for about five years. Oh, my you know? gosh. <laughs> and, yeah, I know we were scouring IMDb, and we actually didn't realize you worked on that until and we saw that you were uncredited for that. Yeah, that's the just... funny thing is that's actually our favorite game, both of our. We love oh, everything really? <laughs> about Metroid Prime. So, I mean, personally, I'm really curious to know what that process was like for you working on that game. Well, I, I'll tell you the amazing thing, and I'll give you an idea of, of why Miyamoto is Miyamoto. Um so we had, I had been at like, a, I think it was the very first E3, in fact, and we were at a Nintendo party and uh, Shiggy comes up to me and, and he says, I'm working on a game uh, and it's being developed in the United States. Um, and, you know, I would like, we've always talked about working together and I would like to uh, get you involved with this game. And uh, the owner of Retro Studios at the time was also a good friend of mine. So the three of us were kind of in this little corner, uh, you know, talking about how they're going to reboot Metroid. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy crap, yeah, count me in. <laughs> and, and so I was the, the first uh, audio person uh, ever hired for the project and at the time retro studios was doing about four other games and they had an internal audio department who were very very good and so they kind of because of my relationship with uh, Miyamoto and uh, they said well why don't you know let's get you know Tommy to work on this and the incredible part about it was this is the genius of Miyamoto. So most of the times, sound effects are also post-production. You know, so for example, when I worked with, uh, you know, uh, Cliffy B on the Unreal series or whatever, he'd give me a chain gun and say, okay, this is the animation, now make the sound for it. And that's the way it's done. That's the way, you know, sound design is done. But what Miyamoto did was he came to me and he said, look, I'm not going to give you any animations of the guns. I just want you to create an amazing weapon sound effect. Oh, my gosh. I, I just let your imagination go wild. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give that to the animators, and I'm going to tell them to make the weapon around your sound. Wow. So I don't want you to be limited at all. So, so things like the pulse gun and things like that, you know, that was me coming up with a, the sound going, okay, let me see. Let me do something like, you know, kind of thing. 
And then and then when it shoots, it goes oh, buh, 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 buh. and they're like, oh, that that sounds like the the screen is actually warbling. Let's let's make that happen. Let's make that animation happen. Oh my god. <laughs> 